But anyway, we learned a lot about each other in all that time. We've become very close. We go to work with each other. I literally spend more time with you guys than I do my own wife. This is true. Um, that's and weird so, to think about. But that's why we get into these little, uh, you know, spats from time to time. doesn't mean anything. Here we oh, 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 here, kill him with this. Here we've done all this work, all this pre-planning. We got the questions. <laughs> Catherine compiled them, printed them off. I've highlighted them, color-coded them. Ryan set up the podcast. And then what do you do we at the end of it? Time, you do nothing all, up until this point, no, and Mark, then you start see, exactly SHI it. on the project. <laughs> I'm sheing on it. I, you doing all this pre-work is exactly what my problem is. You've let them get to you. Okay. So we thought, I think by a listener's suggestion, to do a Get to Know Your Hosts podcast. So what... We're, Can just, I we're always going to write some sort of listener, autobi- We're going to write some sort of autobiography. Why don't we ask might them what they want to know? Say that that listener was me. I suggested it because everybody thought we were always fighting, and now we're fighting. I think that you intentionally orchestrated all of this as some sort of puppet master. All right. Mark, you know I like to wing it. I thought you once liked to wing it, but I now do love I to wing it. But what do you like want me to, to do? Live in the land of the script. This is not a script. This is, these are questions that people w- w- took time out of their day to write in. It's not a script. <sighs> Look how it's written. Looks like a script to me. All right. Well then, welcome everybody to Act One, Scene One. Of the Vortex Nation podcast, get to know your hosts. I've got Mark on the mic here, Jimmy to my right, Mr. Ryan Muckenhern across from me, and we are going to answer your questions. Not what we would just want to talk about ourselves, but actually what you took time out of your day. Sorry, we are fighting. I'm fighting you (laughs) just with my tone. Yeah, you're full on. You're full on dad voice right now. Yeah. You got me agitated. <laughs> this should be we should be rejoicing. I'm starting I'm, that over. No, well, I, it's we it, we can't start over now. We're in. The whole point We're of this in. was to try and explain is it was to and try now and we've go into detail. It. There's all these people out there who listen to us maybe on a semi regular basis, and sometimes we get into our little quarrels or our spats. Or They're not little, even real, you know. And then people go, oh. Oh, what's your guys' problem? I things seem rocky over there. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh and then we giggle behind the scenes because <laughs> because Cause they're think, not. Right. And we think, boy, if only they knew what it was really like, what you know, behind the scenes. And so we right. thought we'd put this together. And lo and behold, what do we do for the last fifteen minutes before kicking this off? We've been engaged in a complete battle of nonsense. And here we are. And, and you're all mad. I tell you what, hey, if you are not, if you're in a relationship, friendship in ours, like if that's that's a type of relationship. If you're not fighting, I don't think that's a healthy relationship. But it's not even fighting; it's healthy. So we debate. are fighting. Healthy debate. Sounds well, like we're fighting. Healthy like we're fighting. debate. But it's not even a debate right now. All we got to do is answer these awesome questions that people wrote in with. Fine. Now they're already annoyed with us. I don't think so. If they watch. They watch the YouTube video, they're going to laugh. I'm starting to sweat. Mark, what are we going to do today? I'm just going to start over. We can't. We We've can't. gone too far. It's, no, we're in you it. We can't right. edit. Well, in the event that this we do start over. This is to get over, to know the host, and yep. this is a very real. In the event we do start over, welcome, everybody, to. <sighs> What's up, everybody? Welcome <laughs> to the Vortex Nation podcast. I have Jim to my right, Mr. Ryan Muckenhern across from me. This is a very special Get to Know Your Host podcast. You're actually acting like we're, we're starting over. This is all yeah, still the same. I'm faking episode. it. And uh, in honor of that, something maybe we probably should have done, you know, in excess of 200 episodes, yes. is letting people get to know us. I mean, I think they find out about us via, you know, all of our conversations, things like that. This is like a more, this is like a more formal version of that. So mm-hmm. we went on the interweb. Catherine was kind enough to uh, solicit 
these questions from listeners, things that people uh, want to know. I'm honored. I mean, h- how amazing for somebody to take time out of their day and ask a question. I don't know. Like, it's uh, that's really cool. So, that's very nice. Question one. This one comes from, uh, and if I, mis- if I mispronounce any names, please forgive me. I think a lot of them are just, you know, YouTube screen names, too, so they might be. Yeah, this is John Pyro via Facebook. Fiery name. Pyro, <laughs> Pyro Piro, I don't know. So, again, uh, definitely uh, correct me uh, if I got that wrong. Uh, question for all three. Which Vortex scope was your first, and do you still have it? Who goes first? Jim, I'll start with you. Oh. You seem to have a lot of input today. Well, um, <laughs> <coughs> my first Vortex scope, thank you very much for asking, was a Razer Gen 1 5-20. to A little bit pinky up for a first scope. Wow. Yeah, I know. But that's un- that's uncharacteristic. That's not your style. No, I, you're right. It's not. Usually I go for the cheapest thing that can possibly get the job done to try and annoy people who go for yeah. razors first. You like to be contrary. I do. But in that case, that was I got a Ruger American 6.5 Creedmoor at the very at the very kind of beginning of the Ruger American uh world that we live in. <laughs> and yes. uh it was in 6.5 Creedmoor. At that time, 6.5 Creedmoor was exotic right, to me. And I was going to go shoot a Vortex Extreme with it. And I thought, okay. oh, I need yeah. something nice. I had never been long-range shooting before. I'd never... I wonder if it was the first time I'd been to Utah. And um, I got that scope, put it on top, and I did indeed make a couple people quite perturbed by the fact that I was actually shooting quite well with uh, with a pretty cheap gun and a really expensive scope at the time put on top. Well, that doesn't make a person feel good when, you know, they've got about 10K wrapped up into their outfit and, like, you're shooting as good as they are right. sort of deal. Uh, I'll I, say this, though, you know, at the time, you know, you're looking... Actually, even to this day, is that the scope with the most travel that we've ever built? 36 what? mils, 125 MOA? Yeah. It was a lot. I was a tall boy. I'm trying to uh, think uh, if the razor. What's yeah, the, I don't know. What's the, six to, we what's have the a new of six things. to thirty-six guy? We Just. have a couple of things that are really up on its heels, but still nothing quite, quite yeah. that gargantuan yet. I don't still have the scope. You don't? Sadly, no, I don't. Really? Why? Um, I actually, Barley? I gave it to a friend. Oh. Yeah. Wow. I got some on. pretty good use out of it. It gone to multiple vortex extremes with me. It was used when I bought it. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, from our, some, we used to have some sort of like a used oh, inventory right. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Um, and uh, it, when I bought it, it was all beat up. I used it pretty well. And then, you know, I beat it up a little bit more. And then I just, somebody else needed a scope. And I was like, use this one. Just yeah. kind of scoped it forward. Yeah, is what it is. Ryan, well, what about you? Uh, John, great to hear from you again. Uh, my first Vortex scope, I won off a prize table at the pandemic match in Nebraska. And it was a Viper PST, two and a half to ten by forty-four, MRAD. Wow! Oh that's, wow! Okay, so that's a unique scope because we discontinued that forty-four millimeter Viper PST yep. Gen One uh, far earlier on than the rest of the Gen One PSTs, and then we kept around the thirty-two millimeter two yep. and a half to ten. That thirty-two was kind of a shining star. That was uh, that was one of the next scopes that I got. Oh really? Yeah. But that uh, that PST, what was the part number? PST two one zero dash M. I think that's correct. I still have it. There would have been two other numbers after yeah, two one. Right? Was it another ST? PST? Or maybe one other number. I can't remember. Yeah, no. I still have it. You do? I do. What's it on? Uh it is currently mounted in nothing. It may be at my desk or <laughs> in one of my safes. Yeah, but I still have it. Good. I used to hunt that scope quite a bit. That'll do. Yep. That'll hunt. I, I think the first thing I, I killed with it was either a mule deer or a pronghorn. One of the two. That sounds Two like of your you. favorite animals. I was going to say, yeah. that, I mean, really, if you you wouldn't even have to really yeah. put too much thought into that 50-50 split. Yep. It mm-hmm. was one of those th- it was. two things. Yep. That, that scope started my love affair with Vortex. Truly. I like it. Yep. That's cool. My first Vortex scope was a Viper, not a Viper HS, a Viper, the predecessor. Four to 12. Am I guessing you're right? Four to 12. Yeah. 
because it was the one with the most magnification <laughs> underneath the six and a half to twenty. So there was one that went higher, which I shot a few things with that six and a half to twenty as well. That was good. Yeah. But yeah, four to twelve uh, optically did really. I think it was a four to twelve by forty actually. Yeah, and, and they had. Did they were they still called the PA at mm-hmm. that point because they were parallax adjustable and that was like a notable feature that you had to call out because it, it was on uh, si- yeah it had side parallax right. on it yep and it was a long boy it's a long boy yeah so we actually get some requests for P- because of the mounting length on it I mean like you know how you much time, how much time it, you got buddy like you could put that thing anywhere you wanted you could have mounted it to a train yeah between the, cars the, the tube very long um, our friends our neighbors to the north. Seem to like they really like that long mounting length. Sure. Yeah. Um. You still have it? I do. I. I. Uh, what did I do? I shot. I think uh, a couple mule deer with it. Shot. I think a couple white tails with it. And then the eight, uh, the Viper HSs came out, and I dismounted it, and I believe it's just sitting in my in my safe as well. But I'm not getting rid of it though because it's my first Vortex scope. And you can't get any more. <laughs> yeah. All right. Something special. Now you guys are making me feel bad. I got rid of mine. Might have to get it back someday. <laughs> Just not via, ask you for know, it back. <laughs> hey, remember that scope I gave remember you? That time I did something real nice. What a question for Ryan. I'm the moderator here. By now, the way. I have a question before we go to the next question. I don't want to derail this. There was a lot of stuff on that page. Yeah. You just shuffled it under. Remember, yeah. he said he was going to go back to the I'm first gonna go page. Back to those, gonna I'm going to go back to those because I like back. those ones for the end. Tracking. This is a, uh, oh boy. Um, People have some pretty complex handles here, Jim. What do you? I, I want to give a shout out here. Talking about uh, stoichiometry over here. Stoichiometry, yeah. Hmm. He. Uh, this question Must for Ryan. Be into tuning. What? What six five did Ryan end up getting? Now that it has been a couple years since the six five revolution episode, which was a pretty good episode. A lot, of, a lot of six five talk in there. There was a lot of six five talk. You know, I said and I something. Think, I think you didn't have a six five at the time for some reason. You're like, but I'll get one. No, that's not true. He's got six fives coming out of his nose. Now, then I what my first gonna, my first six five was 2007. I ended up with two, and I ended up with a Kimber 84 grade two in 260. Mm-hmm. And a Remington Model 7 KS in 260. Neither of those guns are in my possession. Neither of them even made the hunt that I bought them for. But um, so on the 6.5 Revolution podcast, we were talking about 6.5 out 6 Ackley. We were talking about Creedmoor. We were talking about some other cool things. And I had been toying around with a 6.506 AI because my hunting partner's got one. And it is a real firecracker. And I thought, man, I really want one. And at the time, I think I had been aware of a hot new cartridge from my friends at Weatherby, the 6.5 RPM. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was also hot to trot on that. I didn't get either because as Jim will point out and will tell you about my, one of my biggest character flaws is my indecision on things. It's paralyzing. It's, it can be at times. A lot of times it's kind of soothing too because I get... I get crazy about something. I'm like, I really want that. I want that. And then, <laughs> <laughs> you know, instead of spending the money on it, like I like a, like a boat in a bottle. Like a boat in a bottle. Um, I didn't. Buy, I didn't get anything. I still. I still do want to toy <laughs> with both of those cartridges. Um, but they're both kind of unique and kind of proprietary not proprietary because the 65 rpm is like a standard cartridge now but mm-hmm. um, not a lot of data out there on it and so i'm slightly gun shy the thing about so i don't know if you guys know this but i i share that attribute ryan i mean how 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 uh, how many times do i talk about you know this this cartridge that cartridge oh custom 300 wsm then all of a sudden hunting rolls around and i shoot the same same old rifle. same old um but it does save you because you get these um uh, get enamored with these new cartridges or oh, this yeah. is the hot newness and I do need that. And then if you just wait long enough, it wears off. And then you actually want something that's different. And you're like, well gosh, I would have spent all this money on this thing. Now I want this new thing and you just don't get that either. And then you just <laughs> save money in the end. But then I feel like I'm advocating for people to not get rifles. I want that's you, a terrible idea. I want you to know this though. I don't think it's a flaw. Jim yelled at me when we were on the road the other day to the point that I actually went out and had to buy a grill. <laughs> 
Yeah, I did. Yeah, it was at, maddening. You guys were on because the road together the other day? Because every conversation, the other day being like weeks ago, but mm-hmm. every conversation with Ryan is like, yeah, well, I would really love to advance my life in this form or fashion. However, I am in my own way. That's generally speaking how the conversation goes in some some manner. And so I, I just about had it. We were having a discussion about grills, and Ryan was like, well... I just don't, there's gas grills and there's pellet grills and there's charcoal grills and and all this stuff. And I'm like, well, what are you grilling on now? And he's like, nothing, because I can't choose. I was grilling on my fire. Or, Which is fine, but you can cool. also, but, but you can... I don't know. He lit you me so up. Like, so you were like, you kind of you pushed him out of the nest on that one then. By push, swift, kick. So what'd you get? Uh, Blackstone. Big flat top. And have you been disappointed? I have cooked more meals on that Blackstone. I, the, the grill um, was assembled on June the 7th. I've cooked more on that grill in that time frame. So mm-hmm. we're the end of July now. Yeah. Time stamp it. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, so it's, it's just, but it's, uh, <clears throat> sounds like it's a big pan. Uh, th- which An is, outdoor it, pan. It is that, but it is an exceptional cooking surface. Yeah, I mean, but, no, uh, but no, uh, I guess that sounds it's like It's a pan being, that's uh, like as big as this table. It's not just something you can just put on your stove top. It's like 36 inches wide, it's four burners, and then I, I can't remember how deep it is. It's got a lid on it. The fire doesn't touch the meat, though? No, no. Taste the meat, oh, not man. the heat. I like the taste of fire. Um, all right. This is that's a good question. That's going to go down in Mark's quote book. Yeah, I like the taste of fire. <laughs> Mark Boardman. If you could take one, I'm going to start with Ryan this time. That's fine. If you could take one outdoor skill and have it incorporated into schools, oh. what would it be? Oh, that's actually a good question. It is I a like good question. Wow. I've asked actually that thought one? about Who asked that. that one? Uh, Kenny Wolf Jr. <laughs> oh, Ooh, yeah. like strong a guy name. With, that is a strong, strong name. name. He sounds oh like gosh. he should drive a race car. He needs to be yeah. a character in a movie yeah. right now. I'm picturing him right now and Kenny Wolf Jr. He's got he's got some long gray hair, good beard, big barrel chested guy. Probably carries an, ax, uh, an axe or a hatchet. I picture him much younger than that. Could be. I mean, at one time, I'm sure he was. But um, Mm -hmm. one outdoor skill to be incorporated into conventional school. You know, honestly, orienteering. Okay. And for a number of reasons. I think orienteering is important because we become so reliant on, like, Google Maps and and other mapping softwares and, and things like this that people can't find directions to places any other way, like at all. Like you, you just immediately sure. go to the digital format. There's a lot of folks that don't know anything about topography. There's not, I mean, if I handed you a, an orienteering compass and a map, I would say like 98% of people would look at that and be like, what does it do? Um, or what is this paper that you folded up? I think orienteering. And because it would just get people outside and on the orienteering course, they would also discover things like birds and butterflies and bugs and berries and all the things that are great outside. And so it's it's just going to kind of wrap them all up in, in the yeah. outdoors. Yeah. Jim? Uh, come back to me. I'm still thinking on it. All right. There's so many. Well, I mean, this is so me. I've got two. Okay. Speaking they're, they're very, of indecision. They, uh, right. Well, I'm. I, it's, uh, I'm, I suffer from it. Uh, I'm going to go with um, shooting and marksmanship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. think it's a very practical skill that everybody should have for a variety of reasons, whether it's hunting or self-defense or potentially in defense of your country in some aspect. And also, I feel like there's so much uh, misinformation that, that that's presented um, I think it would for a lot of people at a young age, you know, dispel like I guess the myths about you know guns and shooting and if hey these these are tools to be used responsibly you know teach people how to use them responsibly they're not scary if used responsibly there's cert- if if used responsibly there's certainly consequences if you use them irresponsibly grave consequences right um, but I'd, I'd go with shooting and then the other one I'm, I'm, I am going to pick two. I'm going to say fishing because I think fishing is just the gateway drug mm. to like all of the outdoors. You're not wrong. That is pretty accurate. The tricky part is some people end up fishing and never start hunting, but I think you'd get a lot of people That's there. still a win, though. 
Like either way you shake it. Yeah. It's good. It's still good. So I think about that. Like we travel a lot for and shows just, and, and things. Then, and I mean, like so many lessons there too. Like, you know, if you bonk a fish, you're like, oh, wow, that's where fish comes from. Yep. You know? All right, go. Sorry, you travel for shows, No, Ryan. I just, we travel a lot for shows and, and, you know, you go to these various cities and some of them are pro our culture and some of them aren't so much, but you see that guy or gal that's got a vehicle of some type with a fishing sticker on it or the Rapala hat or... You just, you know, you know you can strike up a conversation because you have common ground somewhere. Fishing yeah. is a bipartisan sport. Yeah. Yeah. You can be a total, like, you know. Rotten apple. One side <laughs> and like fishing, and you can be a total the other side and like fish. I'm just not going to get into it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to pick sides here. No, no, but I, I, I've i seen, uh, I've seen hippies and Subarus loving fishing, and I've seen gun guys and big old jacked up trucks love fishing. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah, that's the beauty of it, Mm -hmm. for sure. Or one of the beauties of it. Ryan, excellent segue. Our very own Maggie in the social media department asked the question, Rapala or Rapala, as you just said? Whoops. The answer's Rapala. Jim, do you you, want to weigh in on this? I have no idea. The answer is Rapala. 10,000% 10,000% Rapala. Now, I feel what like you Mr. Know Mr. Rapala or something? It's Rapala. What have you been to his Comment house? below. I mean, it's going to be hashtag agree, but uh, I feel like, so I always called it Rapala growing up, and I believe it might have been R- Mr. Roland Martin, iconic uh, bass TV bass fisherman, started calling it Rapala. I was like, oh, snap. I've been saying it all wrong. It's Rapala. Why would it be Rapala? Because it is. I think you're putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable. R A P, or whatever that is. A L A, I think. Rapala. My outdoor thing. Comment in below. School. That'll probably. I bet that'll be the most commented thing on. My um, my outdoor thing in school would be fire building. Sure. Because. Oh yeah. Because the world literally relies on fire. Combustion is what is the reason why everyone is able to do anything that they enjoy uh, in today's modern society. Um, even power your electric vehicle. What? Uh, yes, powered by coal. Uh, in case you were wondering. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think if you're able to make a fire outside in the wilderness, you can survive. You can do many many things. You can signal. You can survive. You can cook. You can warm yourself. Uh, I mean, just so so many things. Um, It'll save your life. And I'm genuinely like really awful at making fires. If you get if you go like in an outdoor setting with uh, a group of uh, folks, everybody thinks they can start the fire better. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that is one thing. <laughs> it's such yeah. a point of pride starting the fire. It is. I it can is. start a fire, but I start when I lived in Nebraska. The only modification I made to my 1910 home that when the wind blew, the curtains blew, is I put a wood stove in with the help of well, my buddy helped me put a wood. St- my buddy put a wood stove in my house. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, dude, I started countless fires. Oh, that was great. Um, ooh, Ryan, love, love what's, to hear it. what's your favorite bolt to run out of the 257 Weatherby? Uh, 110 grain Acubon would be a good one. Um, any of the barns, TSX or TTSXs, I have a preference to the TTSX, I suppose. Um, everything's application based, though, because what are you going to do with it? You know, are you hunting, yeah. are you hunting pronghorn or, or elk or, you know, whatever. I mean, I think any of those bullets would do the trick. At the end of the day, it's whatever shoots best out of your gun. You can, you know, put a round on target with. That's the bullet to run. But um, strong preference towards bullets like the Acupon and the Barnes. I was going to say, these are bullets that I hear you name yeah. so frequently. Yep. Acupon yeah. Acupon and Barnes. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Those are two that, good ones for I sure. feel like it doesn't almost doesn't even matter with the cartridge for you. It's that's probably if they make it, you're leaning that way. Generally true. That's a, it's like a hyper velocity cartridge. It's a very spicy meatball. Um <laughs> and so with that being said, like you, you should be careful when you're selecting a, a bullet on construction, depending on the game that you're hunting. And and I I'll generally bullet up even when I'm hunting softer critters like pronghorns. Um if you go too fast and you've got a bullet that has a very thin jacket and it doesn't have, you know, some sort of either a, a, a partition or a mechanical bond to it, um, you can have like this crazy fragmentation that goes on and you get poor penetration and you get this horrendous uh, debris field that is your your projectile and secondary projectiles moving throughout the body cavity. And 
Um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of a hole in and hole out and the heavier bonded bullets do a better job of doing that. And then homogenous designs like the barns do just sh- yeah. straight through. Hmm. Uh, here's a question. Uh, what do the three of you do at Vortex when not on the podcast? Maybe it's been mentioned, but, uh, like what do you guys, uh, what are we doing uh, when we're not podcasting? Who's our, who's our asker on that one? That's the uh, Eilis Shram. Right on. Mark, what do you do here? Oh, man. Uh, I mean, my life is work, family, hunt, fish. Those are, I mean, those are the things that I have time for. And then I generally pick hunting over fishing, even though I absolutely love fishing. I is the love question, fishing. And, and the question is kind of like in everything, not just at Vortex. What do you think? I'm not on, maybe it's been. Oh, yeah, you're right. Well, I I'm glad that you went into that. I think that's fine. I just wanted to make sure. For yeah, no, I was kind of I was reading it wrong. So, so they're asking more at Vortex. Yeah. So I do the podcast. I I've been in the marketing department you for about uh, 14 years now. It's been a long time. Various capacities, primarily on the content side of things. Now, doing the podcast with you, Jim Ryan, and uh, uh, some writing. You know, some con- more, like I said, more, mostly on the content side. It's fun. Frequently found in Instagram stories. Yeah, the social media team likes to make me a target. Yeah, you, you know what they always told me when I was targeting. growing up, though. I, if we didn't like it, we wouldn't pick on you. Yeah, that's what they always just means yeah. they like you. That's that's what they always told Big me. Big crush. Yeah, then I go home and they like me so much <laughs> at work. <laughs> <laughs> Jump. Um, I run a little thing called Vortex Edge. We have six full-time instructors. We run some pretty awesome classes in firearms instruction. And you can find all about it on the Vortex website if you just look up training and then you check out Vortex Edge. We have some really cool classes. And the instructors are good dudes. They've been on the podcast a number of times. This Uh, morning we recorded one. This morning we did. That's right. With Chris. That's right. Yeah. So when you see that and Mark and I are wearing the same outfits (laughs) in that podcast at some (laughs) other point, then you'll know that we recorded it the same day as this. Uh, that's what I do among helping out with content stuff and other duties. I've been here for a while. Outstanding summary. Um, I, Ryan, work on the consumer sales and technical side of the house. So if you write in with a question on what rifle scope to get, what binoculars to get, um, how do they work? Um, if you call us, if you, if you walk into the front door, you'll get, greeted by myself or 12 other individuals on that team. I've been with Vortex for about eight years, uh, coming up here in September. It'll be eight years. Um, and one thing I've always liked about Vortex is it, it doesn't matter who I run into here, who I work with here. Everybody wears a lot of hats. So we all do a lot of different things. A lot of hat wearers yeah. as well, yeah. which has been commented on on the podcast, yeah. FYI. I, I was going to wear my hat today. I didn't. Uh, unrelated to that, I just chose not right. to wear the hat right. today. Right. Um, that's a, a common piece of attire here at the shop. But uh, that's something I've always appreciated about this place is that um, everybody does a little bit of everything. And I think that's why it's so much fun and, and um, why it never feels like work. Yeah, like we 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 all we all pick pieces up and move them when we need to, and um, it gets done. So I've I've gotten the opportunity to be on this podcast. I didn't know what a podcast was in 2018 when you guys invited me on there. I thought it was something I had to like pay for. And <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you want so, to be on the podcast? How much? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I didn't I didn't understand what it was. Um. So it's it's really cool. I get to work cross functionally with with the marketing and social teams, and as well as other teams. Um doing all kinds of fun things and it's just super stimulating super engaging i'm never bored always fun fantastic yeah this might be one of my favorite questions of the whole thing it actually comes again from never believe what happens at minute 26 uh yeah we gotta speed this up i got a lot of highlights here jim uh comes again from mr kenny wolf jr oh man and i think this this tells us this potentially tells a lot about a person what type of coffee do you like and how do you take it? Who's going first? Ryan? I'll hit it. Um, I'd love to say I'm a coffee snob, but I'm also very cheap. So the coffee I've been drinking for the past several years comes in a fairly nondescript bag. I ordered it from Amazon. It's $36 for five pounds or $31 for five pounds. Um, I drink it black. Um, usually in the morning, it's, uh, it's just straight out of the old uh, drip pot that I've had since I was in college. And on Saturdays and Sundays, I like to wake up in the morning and I, I like to grind it, 
slowly and, and meticulously and then do a pour over. And I like to eat it with a Stroop waffle. And oh. I'll, I'll usually have two pour overs uh, out of a large Chemex um, every Saturday and Sunday morning. Uh, but black is typically how I do it. And I don't necessarily care where it comes from as long as it's black coffee. Keeps me alive. Look at you. Yeah. So it's like not expensive coffee, but it's good coffee, though? It's coffee. I've had really good coffee. I'm like, wow, that's really good. I don't know if I could replicate it. Yeah. Um, so at the end of that, it's just like it's a thing that um, I tell myself I need, so I drink it. Yeah. I don't ask me any other questions. I love coffee. Yeah. I, I love coffee. Do yeah. you actually? Oh, I do. It's one of my favorite things in the world. Now, I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm crazy particular, like I have to have this kind of coffee all the time. Now, there's a variety of uh, Starbucks blends or Starbucks coffees that I like. And I don't know, do they have like, I don't know, sometimes like you like, you're like, oh, I like this. And then like a company has like political things that you don't know about. So hopefully I don't get roasted. Oh, you're going to get this. roasted for that one. Starbucks is pretty much top of the list. Yeah. Are they? Yeah. Okay. But, well, yeah. I guess I don't anymore drink that. <laughs> Uh, and then probably one of the best cups of coffee I've had though. And again, I haven't checked out, you know, I mean, like, I just like, I went to the store, I got it. It was delicious. So that's all I know about it. Uh, Collectivo here in Wisconsin, they had, and, uh, 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 it was Guatem. they called it Guatemala mountain of the flowers. That sounds like a phenomenal place, wow. man. And that's on art it, school coffee right it there. It was D. Delicious. It was so good. But here's the thing. So I bought a bunch at the place. I was like, oh, this is a great cup of coffee. I had it at the place. With the stuff I made in the pot at home, which I granted I was I was using uh, you know, tap water out of like standard drip thing, dramatically different. Mm -hmm. Like it was not even not even close to what I had I'm at the store. We gotta get some of that reverse osmosis and then, water or something. And then I go back and forth, you know, coffee at home. I go back and forth. It seems like if I, I'm on a about a six month thing where I'll be like I'll drink black coffee for about six months and then I'll drink it with heavy whipping cream for about six months I'll tell you this about Mark if you go to the airport with him you guys are going to fly out things you will do is have to stop and get a coffee Mark wants just a little uh, what do you call it just a little space for cream room for cream room for cream yeah if I'm getting cream which actually I mean if you're on if you're going to the airport or something like that the cream you get otherwise it stays hot too long yeah Scald, gotta, like, like yeah. then, I don't understand how it holds the heat. Then all of a sudden, you're like, you're burning your mouth right before your trip. You're like, oh, I'm going to eat all these great foods on this trip or something like that. And they're like, great, now I can't taste for the next week. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you're pressed for time. You want to drink your coffee, put a little cream. I like, but I do, like, you know, ha the stores come with uh, half and half, you know, but at home. Heavy whipping cream. Heavy whipping cream. Yeah. Mm. Treat yourself. It'll, like, you pour it in and it almost, like, sinks and, like, blooms at the uh, top. It's delicious. It is fun to watch. Jim, what coffee do you like? I won't touch the stuff. Man, enjoy the smell, hate the taste. Won't hate the it. taste. Hate the taste. Are you sure? Hate it. And everyone's always like, you just have that good coffee, and then they try <laughs> and give me good coffee, and I hate it still. <laughs> and I think coffee is stupid. It is. I think it's dumb. Coffee drinkers are never satisfied. They're I'm never satisfied. satisfied. I'm satisfied. They always are, they always, have, it's like every every coffee is an event. It's, oh, let me try this coffee. Then they try it. Coffee they, is like wine. They try it, and then they go, oh, I, I, re I don't like that. I wish it tasted more like that. Did you use the wrong water? Is it a, is it a, did you let it go for a long time? Was the, did you scald the beans? Like, did you, how did you grind it? There's all this nonsense. All those things matter. And all these people claim they need it to like wake up when in yes. reality they've just you've become dependent on it. Yes, yes, yes. Right, I know. And that is stupid. You know what I was doing right before this podcast? Drinking coffee. Drinking coffee. At three PM. Absolutely. And I can't wait get to get back to my desk. That's problematic. It. You know what's good? Water. That keeps you alive. That's pretty good. Um I tried. Okay. What is everyone's favorite rifle they own and shoot? Jim, what's your favorite rifle that you have? Mm, I really like my... What do I like? You know that gun we took on that coyote hunt, that pod venture where I shot a coyote? It's an 18-inch AR yeah. with a suppressor on the end of it, and it just shoots really, really well. Short stroke. You worked on it a little bit at yeah. one time because we had something goofy. 
Uh, short stroke, piston, yep. gun, right? That's an amalgamation of things. Yeah, that's it's, like a, yeah, you, it's a very much a, a Franken gun of all types and uh, and sorts. But but it shoots real nice, heavy as all get out. But yeah, you stick it on a tripod and shoot it. It's just I enjoy the heck out of that gun. It's a good gun, Ryan. It's a very difficult question to ask because I don't know how I can answer it without hurting the feelings of the other arms in my safe that, um, I, in, in, uh, you know, love so much. Um, I really like, I've got a Kimber mountain ascent in 308 that has very much grown on me for the past several years that I've owned it. Um, other people have done more interesting things with the rifle than I have, but it's just one I grab every time because it works every time and it shoots very well. I also have a thirty odd six. Wait, that, is that the Mountain Ascent or is that a Montana? Oh, well, that's a Mountain Ascent. Started life as a Montana, and then it got mm-hmm. turned into a Mountain Ascent. That's well, the whole story. You call it a Mountain Ascent. It is. It is says it? on it Mountain Ascent. Where on the receiver or the barrel? On the barrel. The stock. What is the barrel? The what stock is the, is the gray Montana stock. I know this because it's in my basement right now. Yeah, <laughs> I borrowed it. I, by the way, I need that back <laughs> uh, by like next Tuesday. Um, no, it's it is it is now a Mountain Ascent. The differentiation between a it's mon- the action in the barrel, right? It's just the barrel, and then it's the bolt. Oh, the skeletonized bolt, and then there. the color of the stock. So that it's might be it is. That might be the only gray stock mountain ascent that exists. I don't know that to be true. Um, you can't buy one, but that might be the only Montana stock mountain ascent that exists. It is a mountain ascent um, barrel bolt, muzzle brake, the whole the whole. Kit and caboodle. I do love that gray Montana stock. There's it, something about it. It's a lovely gun. Um, but I've got a an OT6 that started its life as a Remington 700 Mountain Laminate Stainless um, that I picked up from the shop that I used to work at. And I got it for a song. And um, have that gun has been reiterated and reanimated more times than I think I could count in a number of different configurations in stock and trigger. And, and this has always been a 30 odd six. Um, but I have done a lot of work with that rifle. Um, I at one time hawked it to make ends meet and then bought it back from the guy that I sold to. I thought wow. that thing was long gone. I thought it was gone. And uh, we started up a conversation and I'm like, you still got that gun? And he's like, well, yeah, I knew you'd want it back someday. And it was like years later. Very and, nice, and I I paid him double what he hawked me uh, for holding on to it for that that uh, that time, and a, a survivor. Yeah, and yeah. so it uh, currently resides in the in the safe. I might take it out. I have yet to decide on what gun I'm going to hunt pronghorn and mule deer with this year. Maybe it comes back out. Um, it is still thirty out six. It is now in a different stock, uh, with the same scope, different rings, and I love it. But I also love my eighteen eighty five high wall. That's a cool gun. Mm. I don't know. I can't You're pick. acting like me. You're not picking one. I can't. I can't pick. Not that. That's too hard. That's like saying, which one of your kids do you love the most? I don't have kids. I have guns. Love them all. This one. Uh, Mark? Oh, shit. Do I even need to say? I feel like I already said it. It's, it's the 300 Wisdom. Oh, okay. Browning Everybody Able, knows. Stainless Everybody Stalker, knows. 2004. 300 yeah. Wisdom. <laughs> Accurate gun, right? It's a shooter. Not a bad shooting gun. I went on a recent hunt, though. Had a. I missed with it. Did and it was just it was just a flat miss, but it was not the gun's fault. The gun's great. The gun's very accurate. I mean, it's not the first time you missed with that gun, though. No, not not saying anything against shouldn't you, have missed. but like you shouldn't know, have it's missed. It's not like Chip the guns. Shots. It's not like the guns losing it, it no. or anything. You no. know what I mean? Sub MOA gun. That's a good shooting oh, gun. Yeah. Um, this one I don't know what the end. Why is Ryan so perfect? This comes from uh, Chip Stippy via Instagram. Ryan, why are why are you so damn? perfect? Tell us, Ryan. I am the least. I'm the furthest thing from perfect. That's why everybody loves you. That's it. Perfect That's representation of humankind. Yeah. I am very modest too, apparently. No. That's just the reality of the situation. Modesty is uh, a cloak. What is the number yeah. one thing in your life that made you the way you are today? Such an indecisive, proper English speaking, cartridge knowing, you know... SOB. I, Selfless yet self loathing. Oh, <laughs> Do you yeah, want me to get yeah. into this? Martyr. Wait, well, hold on. Because we're, we're 40 we minutes deep and I got a lot of. 
That, this might be a whole session. In 60 seconds or less. In 60 seconds or less, the way I am, the way I am, why I am the way I am. I would say because I had no idea what I could do with myself. And so I hyper-focused on something that I felt I was good at, and this is it. I have a personality trait that drives me to fixation on things, um, and and that this is where it brought me. This is the only place that... That's fate. You're home. Yeah. You're home now. Yeah. Um, That's pretty good. That was- we got one... Well, okay, three questions, one for each of us. What did it feel like to buy my first AR-15? That's for you. Yeah. Who's this from? Uh, Bumpa32. Okay. Yeah. You know that guy. Uh, yeah, we've, yeah, we've gotten stuff from him before. Oh, yeah, Bumpa. Um, so back when ARs were just kind of starting to become mainstream, at least to me, to me as like a more hunting-focused person. Now, there's definitely a thing there, unless you're going to say like back when ARs were becoming mainstream in 2015. Maybe like, no, you missed it. No, I was going to say probably 2000. Six or seven. Okay, yeah. Now that's now you're you're actually that is before a definite surgence in the AR. So that's when I bought my what I would consider my first AR fifteen, but it was a Remington R fifteen. Mm-hmm. It was a camouflage AR fifteen. It was like I wasn't. It's like I wanted. It's like I wanted to be there, but I wasn't ready to to commit. Right, so that's why that's why Remington made guns like that, just for guys like you. Exactly. So it was camo. I was like, oh, this would be a great uh, coyote rifle, you know, fast follow-ups. And then, I don't know, sometime when I was here at Vortex, we've told the story before, but uh, I sold it. To Dom Leatherberry, am I right? No, I sold him a different rifle. Oh. Uh, that he sold. He promptly reversed <laughs> 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 you it. Dude, he's sneaky. I traded him. Uh, it was more of a trade. I gave him, which was a really nice rifle. It was a Browning X Bolt Hunter with the wood stock. No, oh. so I traded him that for a a Gen three Glock and three hundred oh, yeah. and three hundred bucks <laughs> cash. Yeah, and yeah, then he liked that. had a buddy that had a gun that he wanted, but his buddy wanted that Browning, and so then he swapped that for that, and it was like, I don't know. Everybody made out okay in the trade. I'm good, sorry, but good I, trade. I, I brought good in trade. that. To I quote, thought that was the AR, but... Yeah, to quote Dances with Wolves, good trade. Yep. Um, so then I was like, oh, well, now I've got this money. I'm just going to go and like you know put that towards you know getting some parts, and I want to build an AR, and I didn't want that other AR, and then like you know whatever, 10 years later, I still never... like I think I needed new tires, and so I... <laughs> Got new tires instead. I, I remember a Mark Boardman at the Vortex that was in Middleton many moons ago. He was driving a gray at the time F-150 mm-hmm. with the Triton V8 in it. Oh, yeah. And it had a little bit of rust on the bottom, uh, on the body, but it, it still went. Oh, yeah. And I still remember a Mark Boardman of that era saying... Oh, yeah, no, I, I'm actually pretty close to building an AR. I think I only need, like, a <laughs> couple of roll pins, maybe, like, a trigger spring or something like that. And I'm like, in what world did you buy a lower parts kit that was minus sands, a couple roll pins, and a trigger spring? I don't know. Anyway, uh, it yeah. felt really good. Well, then, in a podcast here, you guys gifted me an AR-15 in God, 300 was, short mag. Yeah, it was kind of a pile, too. We never got that thing to shoot. We got to work on that. We keep forgetting to work on that thing. We do. Um, and then, and then I finally finished the other one, and then I like had parts left over. And then I built an AR pistol, and I got three. Now you got three, and it feels great. Bada bing, bada boom. I got a one, ten, a one to ten on one. I got, I got a Spark Solar on the little shorty. Such a convenient little gun. Actually, I, I was thinking about. I, I'll probably get my. Um, I think we'll start with 22s, but I think that'll probably be the first gun that I shoot with the girls because it's so like short, like it complements their frame, you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. so uh, their stature. So, um, cool. Okay, uh, Jim, what was your first car that you modified? Modify is the key word there, and I did some. I did some very minor modifications to a '99 Jeep Wrangler back in high school, but that really wasn't anything uh, substantial. I did some modifications to an 88 BMW 325iS that's in the parking lot right now that I drove into work. Um, 
man, that wasn't really a whole. I mean, that wasn't super. Was that the first either. though? Yeah, I mean, that was the first car that I like really worked on. You okay. know, like that I actually had the whole rear end out of the transmission out of. We swapped it from an automatic to a manual. Put yeah, it's a little modified. Yeah. Wow. A little bit. Does but I'm actually one... in the process. I'm in the process of doing a full on like. Actually, I'm in two process. No, three process of doing a full on engine swap currently, all happening simultaneously. It's a really bad way to go. I wouldn't recommend it. No, it seems like a good way to mix up parts. You're oh, good. and You're... then I also put a flatbed on the Hilux. Pretty big deal. That thing's really awesome. Pretty big deal. Somebody anyway. was asking about that the other day. I just had nothing but positive things. It looks like professional. It looks like you yeah. you went to the flatbed store and said, I need the deluxe. And I appreciate and, that. You know, Jim made a statement earlier in this podcast about being able to do things with fire. It, you learn how to build a fire. Eventually that learns or leads you into forging metals. Mm. And you went from not welding to master class welding in not a lot of time. I wouldn't call myself master class. There's much to be learned. But Pretty I damn will good say, beads, man. Pretty I mean, damn good beads. I felt good that in a matter of like four months, I went from not welding to tick welding an entire aluminum flatbed. And it looks tops. I mean, those welds are like, I I really like aluminum boats. Mm-hmm. And the welds on there look just like the ones that you'd see on a finished aluminum boat, which actually comment below if you'd like to see Jim build a mini jet boat. <laughs> oh, yeah. Please comment that. I hope you do say yes, because I really want to build one. Uh, I'm going to do it anyway, regardless of what you say. But, <laughs> but you guys are too kind, though. All the bad ones are on the bottom, so it's hard, hard to see. I don't Practice know, man. on the bottom. Well, that's very, the top. very jealous and impressed. Thank you. Um, next. So, that's- Ryan, this might. So, maybe I'm misunderstanding, or maybe this person is mis- says, Where was your gun store and how long did you own it? Oh, that's a great question because I didn't own a gun store. Okay. I worked at a gun shop that is still there today. Uh, that is Little Crow Shooting Sports. I actually spoke with Charlie, the new owner, not two hours ago. Um, I started there when I was in high school, and I was like 15 at the time. I, my first honest day's work was unloading a semi full of um, like 1,080 cases of Winchester Super Target 12-gauge um, That'll make you strong. For their biannual ammo sale. So that was in like February. Strong like bull. And uh, that's a that was that was an awesome shop, and I think about that place all the time. Um, so I started there in like two thousand five ish. Dude, one four. of my favorite jobs to this day is working at Outdoor Emporium in downtown yeah. Seattle. Retail, loved yeah. it. I I miss it. it. That place taught me a lot of lessons. Yeah, and, and um, I had so many awesome customers over the years and just like characters yeah that you mm. are you can't replicate them because they were just these most wonderful people that would come in there and, and I was very young at the time but anyway little crow shooting sports Hutchinson Minnesota that's 18482b202 Circle Street in Hutchinson um, if you're in the area swing it's a great shop um, worked there for like seven years do you ever forget what's the significance of the name little crow Is uh, that so from like yeah chief little crow um, right. was a Native American um, from the area, and okay. he was a, a significant player in the Lakota Sioux Wars um, that occurred there. He was killed, murdered, um, about five miles north of my hometown, and um, the Crow River flows through Hutchinson as mm-hmm. well. Um, and so he, he's a, a very significant historical figure in the area. That's cool. Yeah, and so Little Crow Shooting Sports um, is where that got its name. Uh, founder um, and former owner Jim Condon uh, and his business partner John Earhart started that. I want to say like 1983, maybe a little bit before that. I don't think Jim listens to podcasts. John's gone, unfortunately, but shout out to James Condon, greatest man I've ever known. How about that? Yeah. What do we got, Mark? Uh, Jackson via Instagram. Wants to know who wears the pants in the friendship and why. <laughs> Come on. I what, think you, do you know. Think there's an ob- I think you know. You think there's an obvious answer here? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> I, go ahead. Well, I'm not. That sounds like you uh, have some thoughts on the matter. I don't have any thoughts. Brian? You know. I, we're all wearing pants. That's we good. Are That's a pants. step in the right direction. Not shoes. Jim hates shoes. Jim does hate shoes. Mm-hmm. Got on me about shoes. that yesterday, too. I'd like to think we all wear the pants. Equal pants. 
Pretty cool pants. I would say that I have pants. You have pants? Yeah. Where'd you get your pants? Fact. The pants the store? Pants store. <laughs> uh, I think I think that everyone has in this group very unique perspectives on just about everything that we do. We have different pants. Different pants. It's the pleats. Some, it's the pleats. Some. If you were a pair of pants, what would you be? How about that? Great about question. That? Mark, what would you be? I know what you'd be. It's that exact pair of jeans that you wear every day. Yeah, I got like four sets of them. I like them. Yeah, I like a pair of jeans. We can They're pick any good. pants? You can pick any pants. You, oh, what pants? Oh, wow. That's tough. I've got a pair of Eddie Bauer. Um, Those are good pants. Yeah, yeah, I've got a pair of Eddie Bauer, and you got to when you if you buy these, you got to. There's a significance in the, a, a denotation here. It is the. Ascent. See how he says denotation. What does that even mean? That's a denotation. A, there's a distinction. It's the Eddie Bauer Pro Work Pant. They're like the Carhartt Double Front. There's Carhartt pants, and then there's Carhartt double fronts. Right. Do you work in them? Yeah, I use them for hunting a lot. And actually, I got tied up in some blackberries the other day because I was looking for some mushrooms that I never even got a chance to find. And it was I was wearing those pants, and um, I think they kept me from certain disaster. Yeah. I'd be that, that guide pro work pant. I primarily like to wear pinky up performance style hunting pants. You do. However, about one day a year, we do a day of deer drives. Very tough to beat the double front car. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. And the briars mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Yep. So just, true. You can beat them up forever. Forever. Uh, they're good. I got a set of cool, I believe they are the, I can't remember if it's the silencer or the rad kill. Uh, first time I ever wore them was to the Vortex Extreme, where I used my Ruger American with my Razor 5-20. to And uh, there was a fence crossing aspect or component to the course which I had to go over barbed wire which I had never oh, done before careful um I say I'd never done that before like I'd never been outside in my entire life but I don't know I just never found myself crossing barbed wire much um sliced them open my mom stitched them up when I got home the still pants. very young at this point yeah I went home and I'm like mom these new pants I got a rip in them she sewed them up and uh, I still have them to this day. The sew job that my mom did is still good. They're all completely covered in grease and muck and grime and weld burns and all this other stuff. And I love them. And I would be those pants. There They're good go. pants. Good pants. So comfortable. We just spent five minutes answering a question nobody asked. We asked ourselves. <laughs> That's true. We did, didn't we? Then? <laughs> um, oh, this is... Uh, what would everyone's dream hunt to do outside of the U.S.? I've got two again. I'm Come gonna- on. Do one. I'm, I'll go first. I'm going to say Stone Sheep, Canada. Mm-hmm. In my advanced age, that might be a pretty tough hunt these days. You're tough, uh, SO. You're tough, SOB. You'll be fine. Age. In the, uh, what are you, 38? And then New Seriously. Zealand. And then New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hmm. But like, like not high fence New Zealand, like regular, regular New Zealand. Again, tough hunt. Yeah. I think that's some of that stuff, some of the toughest hunts in the world. Tarp look really cool. They also look like they live in very frightening places. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I don't want to be like, you know what I mean? But that seems cool. Ryan, where are you going? International. International only on this one. Come on. Um, For a very long time, and I have no good reason why. Actually, it was because- no, That's from Jen Grilome, by the way. Shout out. Um, When I became enamored with Barnes Bullets, there's a very famous picture of um, Randy Brooks- who uh, brought Barnes into the modern era, if you will. And he has a very large Marco Polo Argali that, that he had killed with a 300 Weatherby, which happens to be one of my favorite cartridges. Um, and I have wanted a Marco Polo for a long time because you hunt them at obscene altitudes in, in a place that is completely as close to untouched by human hands as possible. Um, and it's like at the top of the world, like 16,000 feet. And it's like you're on the ice planet Hoth Dang. when you're hunting them. But like being a realist, I'm probably never going to make that hunt just due to cost and, and the logistics of getting into the... Oh, yeah. I'm not talking... I'm, I'm not going stone sheep hunting anytime yeah. soon, right? Um, I would really honestly probably like hunting fallow deer in Hungary hmm. more... 
I think. My grandmother was born in Hungary, and I've always wanted to hunt there, um, and that would be a cool thing. Uh, really traditional European style hunt. Um, it'd be cool to do it with old guns too. Yeah, like old guns. That would be fun. I like it. I'd take either one of those. It's pretty good, Jim. Where are you headed? What kind of critters do they have down in Argentina or Chile? Oh, cool stuff. Chilean whitetails. See, because I would really like to do some sort of a big transcontinental uh, like journey in yeah. a vehicle, like very custom built vehicle, oh, like an overland like, type thing. Yeah, kind of, yeah, but like drive all the way down there and just explore all the sites that I can possibly see the whole way down. I, I mean, like, I'm talking like a old classic VW Beetle with a V8 in the back and like big oh, exhaust whoa, pipes. Oh, okay. I don't know, something weird. It'd have to be super strange. Yeah. With uh, like some sort of scrambler build motorcycle attached to it. Yeah, that I could off mount <laughs> yeah. and dismount and go up further. Yeah. yeah so uh, that, and then I just, I'd go as far south as I can go in a vehicle. Uh, which I'm assuming would be, you know, Argentina. This, this vehicle that and this trip that you're describing is really matching up with you never wearing shoes. I know, I know. I'd end up in Patagonia what probably with other people just like me. Sort of damn hippie. Um, pretty much. But uh, I'd do that, and then whatever was there when I got there, uh, or if it broke down, I'd just hunt that. There's a lot of stuff. There's yeah. a, there's a lot of cool things. It sounds neat, and I've heard, I I've think, heard uh, wonderful uh, things. I think Red in Argentina. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and maybe they're called Andean whitetails. There's a South American whitetail. It's very are small. Are you talking about the, or what are, what's a fanon? You hear about those fanons? Fanon's a sheep. No. Yeah. It's like a, people, it's like almost like a smaller than a coos deer, I think. Well. I did have a lot of fun hunting coos deer. So. But I know what you're talking about. There's a South American yeah, whitetail. It's either there's Chilean, Andean, too, yeah. or I think it's Andean. Maybe I'm saying this wrong. It's a very small whitetail. Um, they have those down there. They've got Argentinian red stag. They have a ton of crazy waterfowl. And then when you get into Central America, mm. they've got all these fun birds and small, mm. small deer, like micro deer. That's fun. That'd be cool. Anyway, I'd go as far south as I could get in a vehicle and uh, then hunt. Yeah. Whatever's there. Yeah. I'm trying to find. It's not about, I suppose for me, I know you guys, maybe you guys get, a, it's like a specific animal in your head that right. you think is so cool. For me, it's all about the location. The place. Yeah. I love the I place. Like the place is so, I just, you know, I like, I'll just I go like, anywhere and hunt whenever's there as long well, as it's a cool place. I like you looking at that from that angle. And actually, when I think about the selections that I made, a lot of those are actually based on the place. Mm. It's like the animal I'm and sure. the place. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? Yeah, you wouldn't want to hunt it in like a backyard um, or something. Yeah, but. Like I love hunting black bears. But like, not all black bear hunts are created equal. Right. Like, there's certain pl- that there's certain places where you can do that where it's just like, oh, it's so cool. Yeah. Um. Hmm. Oh, Ryan, what's your favorite thing to forage for? That's tough uh, because I really, really, really like fungus of kind of <laughs> any kind. Um. I may Big or may fungus guy. I may or may not fun have. Guy. <laughs> yeah, real fun guy. I may or may not have just gotten back from a uh, basically two-day trip to the Canadian border. You did. I saw the pictures on Instagram. To go find some mushrooms. Um, but I'd probably say berries more than mushrooms. Hmm. Yeah, sure. What is it about finding the berries? Is it just the fact it's that the taste is delicious when you find them? Or they, is it like something about like... Well, see, now I'm going to go back adventure. and forth on this. Like, Especially like really good mushrooms like morels are great everybody likes morels you like go out and chase them and i think that there's like a part of it it's the first mushroom of the year generally that's emerging at least in our area oh i know where you're going um you're about to t- you're about to morels t- are not that good ah uh, yes that's where i they're a good mushroom but they're not that good they're 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 fine that's it that's all they are. Uh, I, They're good, and here's the big plus: they're very identifiable. They are, yeah. You, <laughs> you, 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 it's hard. Although to, I had a whole bushel of false morels at one point. Oh that yeah, was hot to try. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, um, Don't, they're well. good. They're good, but uh, I, I, I don't know, it's that's tough. Wild food, wild forage food, wild hunted food, wild caught food, whatever. It's all very special. Um, I like berries because you usually get a lot of them and you can do a lot of cool things with them. You can eat them like right away too. Yeah. That's, there's they're another, clean, yeah, that's another generally, part of that. You know, like I was, nice. I was picking, sweet, it's a treat. I was picking blueberries this weekend too up there. Um, I was looking at Canada. Were they, there was a lot of, were the berries on? I'd say they were like 60% on. They had hmm. some time to go. Boy, yet. they go 
it's, well, it, That's it early. varies. A couple of years ago, I got six pounds in three hours on July 4th. Wow. It was July 20 Jeez. something. Um, maybe got like a pound and a half. But uh, I was looking at Canada from Lake Saganaga while picking blueberries. And as I got down up from this blueberry spot, I went down a road that I had bear hunted down some years ago, and I found a cap full of chanterelles, which are probably my favorite. Those are good. And then I mixed the two together. I oh made dear. a blueberry reduction. I put it on top of the chanterelles, which I sauteed. Is that legal? Just, oh, my God. Fruit on mushrooms. Yeah, man. Oh. I can actually see that being a God. It's got to be the right mushroom. It was so good. Hmm. It was so good. Jim, what is your dream car project? These last two are from uh, GT Olson 14. What's up? What's your, um, what's your dream car project? Are you working on it right now, or is that yet to come? My dream car project. My dream car project. I don't know. I mean, it changes all the time. I, 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 I really, really don't like... Well, A, I don't like cars that are garage queens. Um, I respect all car enthusiasts, so if that's your thing, I'm not going to get mad at you about it. But if I own the car, I'd be driving it a lot. And, but, and B... I'm not really into like full on perfect restorations just back to like OEM spec. I like the resto mod, if you will. I like to change things. Okay. And um so I'm always trying to think of like what's something weird that I can do that hasn't been done yet. That's also really difficult cuz people have been doing stuff like I like doing for years and years. I'm like super hot to tr- trot on the idea of this the I mentioned a classic Volkswagen Beetle with like a big V8 sticking out of the back of it. Um, that it wouldn't be the first time anybody's ever done that either. Um, but I would like to do that. I'm currently working on something that I think will be really fun, which is a 1700 pound Datsun 1200 pickup with a 350 horsepower turbocharged four cylinder motor in it. Uh, and then like four links. I don't know. Anything, anything as long as it, but I like to take things that aren't that popular and people don't really think are that neat. And make them really, really like stupid and we, cool. We haven't referred to you as Weird Gun Jim in many years. Mm-hmm. And now it's like Weird Car Jim. I like anything weird. Yeah. Doesn't matter what it is as long as it's weird. I like I it. would really love, you know what I'd love? I'd <laughs> love to take, actually, somebody did this too. This explains why I we get along on so well. I saw it on YouTube. Uh, somebody did this as well. They took a Tesla and they dropped an LS in it. Did they really? Yeah, they that's did. Phenomenal. And I just think that's so great because, you know, <laughs> you just take an electric car and you just make something. Just absolutely <laughs> ridiculous just, out of it. Just big. I want the exhaust pipe sticking out of everywhere, and I want it to be loud as hell. It's a cool I, I body say, line I on say that car. that that um that sends a message. It does. It does. It says, "Thanks for the body. I'll take care of the power." <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Top uh, coming from. Uh, Bren 330, top bucket list species yet to harvest. Oh, Bren. Yeah. Hey, Trent. Um, Somebody else go first because I don't know. I got my Mine's easy. Oh, let's hear it. Well, okay. I've got two yeah, again. Yeah, mine's easy. I've got two again, actually, though. I'm going to go with uh, caribou and then, but also, and, and probably even above that, I would say a uh, big Roosevelt bull from my home state mm. of Washington with the bow, though. That'd be special. Have a really good rosy hunt, kill a, kill a giant with the bow. Yeah. That'd be it, man. All right. Mine would be a moose. Okay. I've, I've been uh, I've been a hot to trot on those since I was a lad. When I'm from Minnesota, we had a moose hunt in Minnesota until 2013. Never drew. Didn't get a chance. I think it's a species that in my lifetime may not be able to be huntable in the lower 48. Hmm. And um, that's that's we're doing okay. That's hard to say, and and uh, I I love eating moose. I think they're a phenomenal, mm. phenomenal creature. This this definitely vis- one of the best. This vestigial remnant of the ice age, a uh, huge giant thing, and I would like very much to to chase them through the alders. Mine's Arizona coos deer. Yeah, we've been on that hunt. I just didn't uh, get the chance to make the final connection. Yeah, you you shot at one. With a, with a self bow. With a self bow, yeah. No, that wasn't the self bow. That one was a uh, that one was a trad bow. But oh. I didn't do that. I mean, oh. you, you, trad bow. Yeah. When you think about that, would you get to like twenty two yards on that deer? 
Yeah. That's wild. That felt really good because it, it was sort of like, in some ways, I beat the deer, but I just, you know, I didn't make the, right. I didn't close it like out. Like you had so. your pistol, he'd have been toast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That was really cool. That was actually really spectacular. So, Wessel Germischuysen. Or is it Vessel? Would it be? Yeah, come is on. It, uh, is this German, uh, The German guy. Get in here. Vessel Germischuysen. So if Wants he's from to? South Africa, I wonder if he's, if he's Dutch Afrikaans. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Uh, what age did we start hunting? What rifle cartridge was your first animal taken with? P.S. Ooh, best hello. podcast ever. Hey, big. You probably could hear that. That was Jim's spine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to do that that loud. Uh, Ryan, when did you start hunting? What age? I started going with on hunts um, at about the age of five. Uh, my grandfather and my uncle took me out. Uh, on both a, a muskrat trap line and then waterfowl hunting. My grandfather is one of like the last duck men uh, that I knew about, like obsessed with it, getting up early in the morning and, and pushing through pencil reeds and cattails to go chase bluebills and really whatever duck flew. Um, I would say that I started hunting, like really actually doing it at about the age of six. Um, started again with waterfowl and small game, rabbits and squirrels. Um, and then moved into predator hunting um, probably around the age of 10 or 11. Uh, my first big game hunt, I was 12. It was white-tailed deer in Minnesota where I'm from. I didn't actually kill a deer until I was 16 because whitetails in Fortown, Minnesota, if anybody knows where Fortown is, few and far between, pretty low deer density. So I actually didn't see a white-tailed deer in the woods for four seasons. Yeah. Um, I, I began hunting grouse and turkeys and pheasants as well in, in the interim there. Um, I killed my first whitetail, which still is on my wall in my house now, um, with a Remington 700 BDL chambered in 30 odd six that my father had bought, uh, because he wanted a new gun because that was the second rifle he ever bought. He bought his first in 1983 and he bought a second in probably 2001. Wow. Hmm. Yep. And I killed a deer with that. I was with a hundred and probably a hundred and sixty five grain uh power shock. Nice. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. I'm gonna right back on. I'm gonna back up. I forgot to ask myself a question. This was also from G T Olson fourteen. Now he got you the car question, Jim and uh and Ryan fifteen to four four. He asked me, other than the 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 wisdom. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh you can only own one rifle cartridge. Was it, what is it? And I don't like to be put in that in that spot because it would be the wisdom. But I would say <laughs> it's going to be an odd six. Yeah, that's just that's that's what it's going to be. That's Um, my first. So I started hunting at age seven. I think I had a BB gun before that. Yeah. Which I probably shouldn't have had, but I did. I never shot out. I never shot windows or anything like that. But uh, a lot of shooting with BB gun. Started deer hunting with my dad at the age of seven probably to the detriment of his deer hunting success, but he'd take me. And uh, loved it, man. Loved it. Just, yeah, absolutely loved it. Uh, first game animal I ever shot was a rough grouse with a single shot 410 out of a tree, Ryan, because we all know grouse can't fly. Bingo. And uh, I remember what we spotted this grouse, flew up into the tree. My brother and I got out. He had an How over under. fly up there? They climb. Oh. Yeah. Theoretically, or, he flew into the tree. Or, yeah, to be seen. I've yeah. Never seen I mean, it's kind of like Bigfoot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my brother had an over under 12 gauge, and I was like, I was kind of jealous of that gun, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but I think, uh, and actually, I was new to the shotgunning world. All I'd shot was a lot of, you know, 22 and, yeah. you know, 410 and whatever. And pretty handy with those things at that age and so the idea of like just being able to point and have like these multiple projectiles like you felt like you just like you lightning, couldn't lose. lightning bolt of zeus right and yeah. i was shorter than my brother three years younger and we we're looking for this bird i'm like holy shit. oh sorry oh uh, well that says what i was thinking sorry that's fair and uh i'm like i see it and i raise that thing up pow knocked it out of the tree and i it, to the, like up until that point in my life, I had never had a state of like adrenaline and like euphoria and like pride and accomplishment. Like it was like so overwhelming. 
like so amazingly overwhelming and it was just it was awesome got yeah. it and uh and it was cool yeah i don't know it was awesome my Beautiful. first my first big game rifle was a uh, remington uh uh, pump, Ot six. Was that the seven sixty Game Master? Do you still have it? Yeah. Let me know if you want to part ways with that. <laughs> it's even got uh, my de- my grandfather bought it for me from a guy at like I don't know, like a garage sale or something or whatever. And it's at actually the stock was uh, I think I think it was his wife's gun, so mm-hmm. that she cut the stock off. But it was good for me because I was you know twelve. That's awesome. Yeah. I think my first time I was. I was in my 20s because, I don't know, I just grew up and I was obsessed with sports. And yeah. So I just, like, played sports all the time. Um, and I was like, this is the cool thing to do. I still play sports a lot. And I still kind of am obsessed. In fact, last night I couldn't sleep, so I went out in my driveway and played hoops at 11 p.m. until I could <laughs> fall asleep. Um, it's but, too much coffee. Uh, you got to lay off the coffee. Yeah. Must be. Yeah. But I think hunting is really awesome. The the hunts that I have gone on, I've absolutely loved. I just uh, we talked about this in the episode we had a while back. It was the strange reasons we hunt, or something like that. Yeah, you guys absolutely have something in you that like it was an engine that got ignited and just never stopped running. And I'm more of like that one that you kind of have to like turn on. It sputters for a while and it goes, and you're like, great, and then it just sort of like shuts off on its own. Um, because yeah, as soon as I can, then I get back to the garage and I'm like, all right, I need to build something. But I do love the adventure. So, like, if if some Chilean whatever thing was presented to me, hell yeah, I'm it's on. on. It's on, like Donkey Kong. Um, but, yeah, so if there's an adventure, I'm all about it, and I want to do something when I get there, so it, hunting would be pretty fantastic to do. I like it. What uh, Gerard Bowles asked, favorite carry gun, mm. which I don't, I need to. I feel like irresponsible because I don't. Mm-hmm probably shouldn't let people know that I don't. They're going to know I'm unarmed. Now I have to. Maybe that'll be the catalyst that I actually start. Ryan, you're... I've sported a lot of irons over the years. Um, I really like carrying... I used to carry a SIG P230 and a P232. And I really like the way they wore. Um, They're a slim gun. They fit the hand very nice. Um, Actually, a lot of recoil. Like a fixed breech design. And... And so, or like a fixed barrel design, they don't have like a, a blowback system like the Glock does or anything. And very snappy gun to shoot. Um, and of course, it's a 380, so it's I'm, I mean, anything's better than nothing. But um, I had to dispatch a dairy cow one time, and I used that pistol. And upon the first shot, uh, and I sorry, had, I'm, not, I'm laughing because I all I can picture is Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> the the first I don't know how my mind didn't go there. The first projectile from a distance of about. 24 inches didn't actually make it through the uh, the skull, and so the second yeah. follow up did. And at that point in time, I, I changed I changed course and I started carrying a Glock 26. Um, these days, I'm usually carrying a 43x. I've become enamored with that pistol, um, but I've also carried revolvers. Um, I've carried Glock 19, the 26. I uh, went through a phase where I carried a full size pistol. Um, I've carried a burst of thunder 380. Um, what else? I carried a Beretta thirty thirty two Tomcat for a short bit, um, and I was wow. Uh, yeah, it had a laser on it, Crimson Trace laser. Oh grip. my gosh, was it in the handle where you went? Yep. You, oh yep. yeah. And it was the Inox version, so it's the stainless steel, it's a real fancy gun, like high falutin. And um, I, I started shooting with that thing a little bit more, um, and it failed to eject more times than it worked. And then I realized that that is a liability, uh, so I sent that one down the road. Um, but usually, um, I, I, I would lend to the simplicity of the Glock auto pistol design mm-hmm. and any of them, uh, will do. I favor, I favor the, uh, uh, midsize to subcompact and the new slimline guns. I've got a 42, a 43 and a 43 X and yeah. they're like, uh, they're very, very, very portable. That's what I'd like to start. <laughs> what I'd like to get is one of those 43 X's. Yeah. Um, cause right now I have a 26 and I love the 26. Yeah. And the reason I haven't gotten a 43X is probably because I just am like, I have this 26 and yeah. it works. I can't put a dot on it, though, because it's a Gen 3 26. I don't even know yeah. if they actually have a 26 MOS, do they? Mm-hmm. Oh, they do now? Okay. Well, I guess I just got to get it. But um, I just love that little thing. It's great. Yeah. I'm not a big guy. And I also don't know if it's the clothes that I wear or whatever, but the 26 is 
is about where I get with I can conceal it uh, well and it's not printing and you know all that stuff. Not that I really think printing is something that people need to make as big of a deal out of as they do make out of, but I get it at the same time. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You know, if I had my if I like could just carry whatever I wanted and it were like a perfect world where, where, well. I have this 357 Magnum, magnesium, or no, scandium yeah. frame, J-frame, Smith & Wesson thing. It was the first gun I ever received. My dad gave it to me when I was 12, which is not the gun you give a 12-year-old for no. what it's worth. Didn't he also say something like, don't tell your mother? Uh, that might have been somewhere in there, along with, like, don't point at yourself or something. But um, <laughs> I love shooting that gun. It's the most fun gun I have to shoot. And I just, I want to carry it, but it's only got five shots, you know. It's an internal hammer revolver, and so as much as people say revolvers are, like, the most, you know, reliable thing on the planet, they're actually, like, probably no more reliable, if even maybe less reliable than, like, a Glock. Uh, You know, and so for all these reasons, I don't carry it, but I just want to carry it. Darn it, I want to carry a revolver uh, because Because I love shooting that gun. Yeah, maybe I do. I, I bought that an gun. That gun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that gun, it like that hurts. It perfect. hurts so good to shoot. Yeah, I'm surprised. Those things are very uncomfortable. And I, you shoot, love I that. shoot Hornady just Critical Defense out of it. Glutton just, for bam. punishment. Yeah. Oh. It's good. Oh. I don't know. I'd probably. I've got a Gen 319. It's a good gun. Still, the Tommy Leatherberry Special. That's it. That's the one. Is that the one with the stippled frame? Yeah. And yep. a tan slide. Yeah, it's got a yeah a FDE dura coated slide. Uh, I think that was probably even back before Cerakote was like the big. Thing. Was dura coat before Cerakote? Did they commercially emerge popular? like congruently? Or I'm pretty I'd sure it's dura coat. The, the accessibility of dura coat and the f- affordability probably put it on scene as more popular. Yeah, first. early on, yeah. So I could definitely carry that gun. Um, the Gen the Gen fives are pretty sweet though. Like I think I'd probably if I was going to get a new pistol, I'd probably get a Gen five nineteen. Yeah, and carry that. I mean, it's not that much bigger, right? No, not not no, than your really current no, it's nineteen. Not. It's same gun. No, but I mean, like then like um um like a twenty six. Like a twenty six. Yeah, yeah, it's considerably larger, a little bit heavier. In the grand scheme of things. Yeah, I mean it's yeah. Both um, are good. Both are good. Carry a nineteen for. I think if you too. get a pistol now. There's no reason you shouldn't get an optics ready pistol. In fact, you absolutely should get an optics ready pistol. Even if you decide not to put a red dot on it, there's absolutely no reason you shouldn't get one because it just affords you the flexibility later on. It's my suggestion. Jim, you're kind of a health food nut. We're going Ugh. we're going long. No. Long winded. No, that's okay. Uh uh CSM underscore six oh five asks deepest darkest okay f- favorite. Favorite fast food you know, you, oh uh well hmm, i guess if we're getting like a little deep dark you know kind of like a guilty pleasure uh so but qdoba is by far qdoba is by far my favorite i love burritos i you know all these things i'm a huge snob about burritos but really? man i love taco bell what yes yeah you didn't know that who are you what do you mean taco bell is delicious get i can eat in one sitting Six to seven Crunchwrap Supremes. And feel totally fine afterwards. I just like the regular hard shell Taco Supremes. I bet I could oh, eat. The hard shell ones are a, a pain in the butt. Oh, it's just I like, a I'm a hard afterwards. shell. I like hard shell. That's, what, that's next podcast. Hard shell or soft shell. Go. Um, we can ask the viewers. What's they yours? Comment below. What's yours? I, I know what it is. But you know what it is, too. Uh, I don't know if this will surprise you or not. But I do love me some... Taco Bell. God, God. But I'm going to say a gas station hot dog oh. with with the nacho chili and cheese with ketchup, mustard, and the nacho chili and cheese and probably some jalapenos yeah, on that's it. Right. That sounds right. That's right. That is a guilty pleasure. Oof. I haven't had one in years. But they are delicious. What's yours, Ryan? Uh, McDouble with Mac sauce. Oh, that's good. We at, at we'll call it Old Vortex when we were in Middleton, we ordered... Um, we did a, a, we'll call it a group buy <laughs> at McDonald's. <laughs> I think there was 16 McDoubles with Mac sauce on there. There was 60 a nuggets. It was $80. And McDonald's, if you buy large enough quantities of food, have a very robust and sturdy 
double handled carrying bag. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. We did the That was a classic McDonald's in Middleton too. Yeah. We did a caloric like in there. We did a caloric content analysis of that lunch and it was heinous. Yeah. It was bad. Yeah. Like you're lucky you guys survived. I'm surprised the physician didn't reach out. It actually probably not, comes with a health or there's not it. some sort of like paperwork you have to do yeah, when like, you achieve like, you're that gonna level. Sign, if you're gonna if you're gonna yeah. buy this quantity of McDoubles, you're gonna have to sign this. Yeah. Or, <laughs> it was it was a rough. release farm of your of your life. A couple of McChickens in there, but that I I don't do that one very often. I'll get I'll get with pretty decent regularity if I'm traveling in the morning a um, sausage egg and cheese McMuffin. Mm-hmm. I also get it with an orange juice and a black coffee. I'm not a fan of the uh, potato thing. They call them hash browns, but oh, it's, it's just, delicious. Well, it's not, but um, I don't. I don't Agreed get that. Disagree. If I eat anything from McDonald's, it's an instant, just bad situation. Yeah, yeah. I, that I can happen this. too. I don't know when that can is. happen too. Caleb Rise, something like that, says uh, you wake up at four a.m., can't fall asleep. Work starts at eight. How do you fill the four hours, Jim? <laughs> apparently, you're shooting hoops. I'm shooting hoops. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. Uh, I'm probably going to drink coffee and watch Ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be able to find it. Nobody can find rid- Ridiculousness on cable television like you. Mark could find Ridiculousness on VHS. Mark, I don't know Mark could find It's ridi- not like, hard to find. It's literally turn the TV on, turn it to MTV. Airdrop, airdrop Mark into the middle of the Gobi Desert with nothing more than a tube TV <laughs> and a twin ear <laughs> antenna, and he will find ridiculousness Add on that TV. a little tinfoil, <laughs> and there it is. Uh, Ryan, what are you doing? At 4 a.m.? Yeah. And work starts at 8? Yeah. I'm doing emails. It's a terrible idea. I'm sorry. I am what I am. Um, somebody asked what my biggest deer to date is. Actually, it's Gabe, Gabe Schultz. Um, I don't know. Like, I mean, I guess I know. Like, I haven't had them scored. Um, I shot a nice white tail in Wisconsin here, but it's probably like what one forty. How long ago was that? A couple years ago. Yeah, with the bow, biggest bow buck, might be my biggest. And then I probably shot a mule deer that I think is in the sixties somewhere. I don't know, maybe seventy. I don't know. Didn't put a tape to it. Fond memories though. You just know in your head, particularly the white tail. That's a bigger. That was cool. That was the most excited I've ever seen you. You were here. I came to Vortex because I was like, Ryan, are you still at work? I, yeah. I must have taken the day off to hunt that day. You did. It was a work that day. was a very blustery day. It's cold. It was because we staged pictures out on the hillside. Yeah, shot it. Yeah, it was another snow yeah. on the ground. Mark hunts best in absolute dog in climate crap weather condition, yeah. conditions. Yeah, it's uh, that was a stellar buck. Ten yeah. pointer, as they say. You backed it in the garage. Yeah. It was so cold. That was a really good fall for me because my dad, I'd shot a black tail yeah. like a couple weeks earlier when I went back home and he had shipped it to work. So Ryan helped that me load was. that up in the coolers that my dad shipped. And then uh, and then we had the the new deer in Beautiful. the truck too. Beautiful. That was great. That was a good fall. That was yeah. like probably one of my best falls. Um, yeah. I don't know. Uh, deer Slayer, J- JCV, says y'all should do a Nerf War. Nerf War. That's that's just good advice. Mm, yeah, we actually did. It, there was some footage of a Nerf war between the Edge team and the marketing team at one point, and that was yeah. that they was took an all out they slam. took that on Mark pretty personally. Yeah, yeah, those guys get pretty competitive, but uh, we should we should have another one. Mm. What do we got now? Mm, this one's to, gonna go a little bit longer. Yeah, we're but, going you know, long. We've, we've been going for a couple hundred episodes, so you know, people at this point, if it, the fact that they've been listening this long and don't know anything about us is surprising. Brett, Brad Bartlett, 143, wants to know what our dream African species to hunt would be. Oh, easy. What's yours? Let's hear it. Spiral horned antelopes. Oh, that's not one. I can only pick one? Yeah. What? Lord Derby Eland. Oh, sick. Yeah, yeah. that's a good one. But I want to oh. do it. I want to do it old. I want to do it with a British under lever hammer gun. Or I want to do it with a 1903 man like a show an hour. I think I don't know exactly what rifle I'd want to do it with, but I'm I just it would be just a classic Woodstock 375 H and H, and from from Dikers to Elon to Kudu, everything's going down with the 375. That's what I. But what's your one? The one, the one species. Oh man, Um, spiral horn. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe. Uh, Can you name them? 
Kudu. That is one. I mean, that's everybody's. Like, like, that's such like a fallback, but they're just so cool looking. Yeah, they are neat. Um, those Elon are just giant stout critters, though. I, uh... And Impala. I mean, those are like two... Cl- like, I feel like... Yeah. I've never gone, you know? So if you've gone to Africa a lot, you're probably like, yeah, nah, maybe I don't need another one of those. I don't know. But I think they're I think they're cool looking. Hmm. Springbok, cool. There are, there's a lot of cool stuff over there. I don't know anything about African big game. I wouldn't mind hunting something with like a really cool African dog, though. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because I think some of those African dogs are really neat, like Rhodesian Ridgebacks and stuff like that. I think they go after... They're like lion dogs and stuff like that. That is the fable. Yeah. I know... Talk to a couple of people that have run Jack Russell's for Jaguar or not Jaguar, excuse me, that's South America. Leopard. Leopard. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, Jack Russell Terriers. I think they have one of those caracals over there too. Yeah. You know, like a different type of cat, I think. I think, I think dogs are neat and yeah. I wouldn't mind hunting something in Africa with a dog, but somebody would have to tell me what that was gonna be. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um Okay, what what vortex glass do we prefer? I'll just go. I'm going with a set of UHD ten by forty twos. Razor HD 4000 handheld range finder. That's mm-hmm. going to be, like, those are my staples. And then if I'm gun hunting, I'm going to throw a 3 to 15 LHT on the top and call it good. And you'll mm-hmm. kill anything mm-hmm. on the planet with that setup. There, set it's done. I knew he was going to say that. That's no surprise at all. Ryan, what do you have to say? Viper HS 2.5 to 10. By 44? Yep. Mm, good scope, good yep. scope. Razor 11 to 33 for a spotter. Binos I can go a lot of different ways on. If you're looking for the best bang for the buck, period, the end, it's the Viper HD 8x42. If you're looking for the pinnacle of optical performance, it's the Razer HD UHD 8x42. Yeah. Yeah. Spotting scopes I don't use enough. I'd use anything in our lineup. I mean, honestly, it's hard to say because I just don't use them enough. But binoculars, I just love the Diamondbacks, man. They're so good. The Glock of binoculars. It's the Glock of binoculars. The old, I mean, like, you get a Diamondback, if you want to give it as a gift to somebody, they're never going to be displeased with a Diamondback, no matter like what level of you know uh, experience they have with optics. They're great to use. I love the Diamondbacks. So I'll say that. Obviously, if I were to say the best one in our lineup, I'd say the Razor HD, just like Ryan said. Rifle scopes, I don't know. That one's hard to say. I I was actually trying to think through that, and it was hard for me to pick. But maybe that Strike Eagle 5 to, tw- uh, 5 to 25. I think that's a really cool scope, and you can just use it for anything. You could hunt with it, you could shoot PRS with it, you could you'd stick it on a twenty two, and you wouldn't feel like you totally out over scoped a twenty two. Wow. Um, you can do you can do anything. So I dig that scope. It's a good scope. I like that. Um, who's the best shot with Magnum rifles, Ryan? <laughs> Mark Boardman. Mark Boardman. Oh, I don't know about that. Mark Mark Boardman. Boardman. Ryan, you are an excellent shot. Mark. Mm- Boardman. Mark Boardman. Well, it's dad I strength. I appreciate the compliment. It's dad strength. I can I get a minute out of his rifle. A minute. Mark goes up to the table, four tenths. I told you I missed with it the other day, though. Um, it was a fluke. So, Jim, these are uh, so uh, these are directed towards you from uh, Joey Kubota. Hmm. Kubota. Damn it! Like the power sports. Damn it! Bring back Jimmy cooking the in the toaster oven. Facts. Mm. Yeah. Followed by uh, uh same same guy. Uh tortilla chip reviews were awesome. He was paying attention to your chip reviews. Uh, Joey Joey Kubota. Do I know Joey Kubota? Those not were good reviews. People, not many people are aware of that was uh, a uh yeah, of was... the chip reviews. That was kind of a shorter stint that I had there. Um I'm glad you enjoyed them, Joey. Uh, it didn't. Did, they didn't get a whole lot of traction. I will say Instagram's been a little bit funny lately. You know, they really like the reels. You know, they're pumping those more. So your stories, those those haven't been doing as well. These are all things that you know you hear behind the scenes from the social media team, which I'm not on anymore. Um, now that I'm running all the edge stuff, so no, I'm kind of a, a little bit out of the Instagram game. I haven't even had Instagram on my phone for a while, admittedly. Um, so slightly enjoying that lifestyle. However, I have heard of some people requesting the uh, the pizza oven come back. That one, uh, if you if you stuck with it from the very beginning of time, it, it happened for oh I don't know probably started seven years ago, um, and uh, honestly the ideas just kept getting so crazy um, that I just kind of kind of ran out of ideas. There was other stuff I'm sure I could have stuck in a pizza oven, but I kind of it just started to run out of ideas. They started getting ridiculous. Like these things were taking like hour an hour and a half at a time. It was hard to put things in the oven or fit things in there. 
cast iron started getting involved. It was pretty intense. <laughs> um, so it just I don't know. It escalated quickly. one day. One day I feel like maybe it could just come back naturally what it once was when it very first started, which was literally. And I'm not kidding. The first time ever we posted anything about a pizza oven on the Instagram story, it was just heating up. A hot dog. And it fell and through. Then, and then it, they fell, fall it fell on behind. The... It fell behind the rack. It was an old school pizza <laughs> style, and it fell behind the rack because they just rolled right off. We need to repost the OG pizza. Oven. There's That's somewhere. What we need to I probably do. got them on like an old old iPhone or something like that. But anyway, it'd be nice to go back to just the old wholesome, real quick, not crazy pizza oven uh, stories. Those are great. Oh, I gotta say, man, spam sushi. Game oh, that was so good. Uh, see, that was the pinnacle. That really, I should have stopped after that. They just, that was unbelievable. Golly. Mm. Spam uh, musubi, as they call it. Some of our Pacific Islander friends actually helped us, help me figure out how to do it Gosh. the right way. Uh, like the recipe and the cooking. It was awesome. Legitimately good. And then also tasted so much like regular sushi. It's like, why well, am I still yeah. love regular sushi? Like, I'm not going to stop eating it. But like, it wasn't that far if, off at the same time. If I was served that at some five-star fancy sushi restaurant in a big metropolis of some sorts, I'd yeah. probably be like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, that's what I expect to get. Yeah, let's seconds. get another roll of those. Yeah, yeah, uh, chef, please. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Joey. Josh Bubb says, he says, show us Seamus, the Shamus. <laughs> The sh- the shamus is more of an idea it's than anything of, uh, else. Yeah, he yeah that's what that's what the shamus that's is. Funny. It's like I haven't seen him myself. Yeah, once I thought I saw him, but then I thought maybe this is a dream, and then I don't remember what happened from there. Best dream you ever had. Best dream. We're gonna cap with the unless you had anything to add on that, Ryan. I was no. I mean I. It's one of those things that can't be seen. It's like it would the, kill it. It's like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Everybody likes the allure of something they don't know anything about. Yeah. But once you know about it, you ruin the allure. Exactly. Well said. Last one. We're going to wrap it here. Okay. Well, before okay. we wrap it, we'll do like a little wrap thing. But uh, why uh, Joshua... Oh, boy. Josh... Joshua Heller, I'm just screwing up. Anyway. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm start trying. Like I want to give credit. Joshua, but I just need to stop, then Joshua Ayler, I okay. think, or Eller. Uh, and this is a good question. Why isn't Ryan M a main co-host yet? And I'll I'll answer good that question. I'll answer that. Uh, because we, because then he wouldn't sit across from us, and that would be weird. Then there'd be three people on this side of the table. And then also, Jim, who would we talk to? It would be just a conversation amongst ourselves, which we've kind of been having. Right. And by now, also, probably a lot of people have tuned out of. <laughs> and if you've done that, good call. I don't know. Yes. That's he's, why he's on this episode. Exactly. It's just that he he's is. always across the table. He's just Yeah, we just need to balance out the table a little bit. It's more about balance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ryan was Ryan? Ryan Ryan was a gift that we stumbled upon. We started the podcast. Mark, you and I were on it from the start. Yes. And then we were like, let's interview this guy. I mean, honestly, it's kind of his whole I mean <sighs> people have been stuff. wondering. His performance review has been looking a little bit shaky. So let's try and see if we can give him at least one more shot to do something worthwhile here. Oh Put him on the podcast. Everybody loved it. And, uh, you know, so he's definitely carved out his place here. It's just that, you know, we have seniority, so. (laughs) (laughs) Who would we ask questions to? I don't know. It's just, yeah. It has been one great adventure. It's very interesting. It's changed the way that I consume media and information. So now you know what a podcast is. I do. And I listen to them daily. About all number of things, all manner part, of things. And you're part of one, a big part of one. It's a great honor. Everybody's favorite I, part. Look I, at the questions. They're all for Ryan. What Everybody if, loves Ryan. Uh, that's what, unbelievable. What a phenomenal way we can engage. We had a gentleman from South Africa on there. Isn't that unbelievable? I, and I Thank you. I, I mean, gen- genuinely, thank you to all these people who wrote in. This is, I mean, thank you. Like, this is awesome. Mm-hmm. A lot of these questions are like, 
you know, the bucket list questions and things like this. And, and I realize that like, I won't be able to get to do all these things in whatever time I have. Um, but I get to live vicariously through a lot of our friends and customers because we get like pictures of, of people hunting, you know, the Eastern Cape or I I had a gentleman who was hunting in Cameroon, sent me a picture and, um, guys and gals in Australia and New Zealand and all these cool places. And it's so neat that, that we get to communicate with people across the world. And, and like, it's one thing to say that like, Oh yeah, we, you know, we get to talk to people, but we really do. We get to engage with them on a very regular basis and it doesn't cost us a crazy international phone call in order to do this. I think it's just awesome. Yeah. Well, and it's on stuff that like they're most passionate about, yeah. right? It's yeah. not like, um, I mean, I guess sometimes it could be like, Hey, my widget, you know, X, Y, Z, right. Yeah, yeah. But also like, it's still related to, yeah. you know, things that you're just like stoked about doing in your spare time. Yeah. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. We don't have to talk to people on the phone about their power bill. <laughs> right. And I'm really glad about it. Oh yeah. 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 I think it's neat. And I'm going to get off track. It's like, regardless of where you are in the world as a, as a hunter and enthusiast about what, what it is that we talk about on this podcast, even if we didn't speak the same language, and we could like depict what we were talking about in the sand around a fire. We would all still get it. Yeah. And I think that's just the coolest thing. Yeah. That's super neat. One last thing. What do you got, Jim? We just got to address Mark. Are we fighting? No, we're not fighting. Good. <laughs> no. <laughs> At all. Mark, we've uh, just, I, I did. The, also want this episode to address that one for anybody who's watching. Mark and I have worked together for 14 years. It's hard to believe. I know. And you learn a lot about somebody in 14 years. Also, us and Ryan for eight years. You learn a lot about somebody in eight years. I feel like you've been here a lot longer than eight years. I should have gotten sure it. Doesn't it Sep- September. I still remember the first time I ever met Ryan. I actually walked up to him and I said, hey, are you Ryan? And he goes, oh, one second. <laughs> Whatever he was doing on the phone. Whatever he was doing on the phone was so much more. Probably important helping than one me. of those customers. Right. So that's my first memory of Ryan Muckenham is telling me to buzz off. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we learned a lot about each other in all that time. We've become very close. We go to work with each other. I literally spend more time with you guys than I do my own wife. This is true. Um, that's and weird so, to think about. You know, if you can imagine your relationship with your significant other, if you are married, then you can imagine the type of relationship that we have in terms of just friends, not, you know, uh, anyway, we went into that earlier, the friends relationship thing. But that's why we get into these little, uh, you know, spats from time to time. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't. In fact, sometimes you say like, you know, I'll be doing something and you're like, God, you're just like Cassandra. <laughs> Yeah, Which you I are. don't know if that's. I mean, maybe it's a compliment. You are you like married the male her. version of my wife. I just can't get away from that personality type. Apparently, you're it's here at work, drawn to it like home. a moth to a flame. Apparently, <laughs> what is it you said earlier? Well, I don't know. Love the taste of fire. <laughs> I love the taste of fire. <laughs> Damn uh, straight. Like, yes. I like my fire straight. Um, awesome. Well, thank you for listening, everybody. Thank you for asking questions. We actually have a lot of things here that aren't highlighted that we're like. Maybe less so questions, but also like really good podcast topics. So Mm -hmm. thank you for what is likely going to be a lot of um, future topics. Yeah. And uh, yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate everybody out there. Appreciate you guys. I don't know. Maybe the people learned some some, uh, insight into us as, uh, you know, regular human beings. Uh, Taco Bell, Jim. Our love of Taco Bell and gas station hot dogs. Oh, man. Taco I don't know Bell. why that's surprising you so much. Of all the things we talked about, Taco Bell is the one that's going to throw you off. Yes. It's amazing. Yeah, it's good, Ryan. You're wrong. Seriously. Thanks, everybody. Ryan's wrong. As usual. He's rarely wrong. But he's wrong about this. We'll catch you on the next one. See ya. Bye. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.